Before Epstein was the Franklin cover-up, before that, the Finders, and long before that, the Cleveland Street Scandal. Pedogate Primer is a concise intro and overview of a growing child abuse epidemic worldwide. It features shocking instances of institutionalized and organizational pedophilia throughout history. Churches, cults, the world of arts and entertainment, the government, NGOs, charities, and major corporations are all complicit or culprits in many instances. Pedogate Primer delves into material that for many may seem like the stuff of conspiracy theories. For this reason, the book draws on academic resources, declassified documents, and other reliable sources, and steers clear of conjecture. Such shocking true stories need no embellishment. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, 7 days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents, they handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMD Law. A flooded home or business is never easy to deal with. You're left with a mess to clean up, having to deal with the insurance company to pay for the damages, not to mention the memories that are lost that you cannot replace. An Aquadam can be another tool in your arsenal to protect your home or business from the floodwaters, a hurricane storm surge, or the king tides. Give Aquadam a call at 707-764-2119 or look us up online at aquadam.net. We can help. We're also offering 10% off the price to anyone who mentions they heard this ad on the Opperman Report. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories strategy of new world order resistance high profile court cases in the news and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more it's the opperman report and now here is investigator ed opperman okay welcome to the opperman report i'm your host private investigator ed opperman uh, you could find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting uh, through my website, emailrevealer.com, or you can uh, contact me for PI work at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. If you like the show, be sure and check out the Patreon because we put up about eight hours of new content on Patreon each month. And uh, all the shows you can hear Monday to Friday here on AMFM Radio, you can listen to on Patreon with the commercials and the ads cut out for all the people who like to complain about the ads. Uh, all of our archives, you can go to Spreaker.com, and that's where I do an exclusive show there uh, to Spreaker, Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and uh, there's a chat room, and you can get an email notification anytime I put up new content. I put up repeats every night. I'm really excited about today's show. We have Tony Rettman. Uh, you can find him at substack.retman.com uh, and also uh, no idols HC bigcartel.com, uh, where you can find all his books and articles. Uh, mainly today, we're gonna, there's a lot of uh, writing about punk rock bands, but also we're going to be talking about, uh, I guess, these revolutionary groups of the 60s and 70s. Uh, Mr. Tony Redman, are you there? Yeah, I am here. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Tony Redman? Hmm. Uh, well, I am... I'm a 50-year-old man. Uh, I have uh, had an older brother who got me into um, punk rock at a very early age. I started going to punk rock shows when I was 11 years old and uh, really, you know, uh, it, it was impressionable on me. So uh, as I got older, um, you know, in, in punk rock, it was either two things. You start a band or you start your own magazine, like fanzine. So I was too young to start a band, so I started a fanzine when I was uh, 14. 
and started interviewing bands and reviewing records and kind of stayed on that road for a while. Um, as a, you know, as I graduated high school, I didn't go to college or anything. I just kept doing, uh, fanzines. And from there that kind of pushed me into uh, freelance writing about music. And also as I got older, I started, um, uh, writing books about the history of American hardcore punk. Uh, I've written three of them so far. Uh, the first one was in 2010. It's called Why Be Something That You're Not, Detroit Hardcore, 1975, excuse me, 1979 to 85. Second one was NYHC, New York Hardcore, 1980-1990. And the last one was Straight Edge, A Clear-Headed Hardcore History. And that came out in uh, the fall of 2017. And... Uh, I've done a few little things here and there uh, on my own in regards to like little chat books and things like that, that I print on my own, but those are the three official books that I've, that I've written. And uh, I've also, yeah, I've written uh, freelance uh, music writing for vice village voice, uh, Red Bull music Academy, a magazine in England called the wire uh, for Bandcamp daily and uh, a few others. And, yeah, you know, in the past few years, I've kind of branched out of writing about punk rock and uh, writing about uh, you know, radical, uh, radical leftist urban guerrillas in America in the '60s and '70s. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm on your uh, Amazon page right now um, with all your books: yeah, Straight Edge, uh, uh, NYHC, uh, New York Hardcore. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff. Very, very uh, wide variety of topics here. But you wrote a couple of articles though about. Uh, the radical left, right? And uh, yep. so give us an idea. What is the, uh, what are we going to be hearing about today? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I wrote two articles in the past couple of years. One was about uh, Sam Melville, who uh, went on a series of, uh, I guess, bombing campaigns around New York City in uh, late 69 and 70, and I think just 69, and um, eventually was captured and put into Attica and was one of the people that was uh, vote, like uh, pretty prominent in the Attica uprising. Uh, he was also uh, murdered uh, in that uprising. Hmm. And um, the other article I wrote was about a group that existed in uh, Pal- Palo Alto, California in uh, the early 70s called the Venceremos, not to be confused with the Venceremos Brigade that was in Cuba at uh, roughly the same time um and they were um you know they started out like most of these groups they were um, college kids and uh then it kind of morphed into taking in other people outside of outside of uh higher education and um what eventually happened was they they kind of got larger they started a newspaper they got very uh vocal in their issues with uh you know imperialism and and uh racism in America, et cetera, and, uh, and the prison system, and they got caught up in a um, prison breakout of someone that was a Vence Ramos member, someone who uh, was inducted, I guess, into Vence Ramos while in prison. Uh, they got involved in a prison breakout for this person, and uh, in, in that, one unarmed uh, police officer was killed point blank. One was just... Uh, wounded and uh eventually these people got caught and uh, you know went went away to prison but the thing is is they are considered the precursor to the symbionese liberation army Mm -hmm. which of course um uh assassinated marcus foster and uh abducted patty hearst and it's uh you know i if there's a catalyst to any of this of like why i started to write these articles in the past few years it is something that I was interested in uh, here and there as a kid. It just kind of went hand in hand kind of with the punk rock rebellion thing. And also, you know, punk rock can also be, uh, you know, a very leftist uh, politics. So I, I had a I had a working knowledge of like weather underground and the kind of, you know, white radical groups. But um, I would say the catalyst was, uh, I guess, I, I guess maybe it was like 2017. There was that uh, CNN thing about the abduction of patty hearst and i just thought it was horrible (laughs) um it was it was that and as well as jeffrey tubin uh put out a book at the same time 
And like both of those things hand in hand, I was just like, hey, like I'm not an expert in this, but this is bad. <laughs> you know, like this, there's not a lot of uh, meat on this bone and you're just kind of like, you know, glazing through a lot of this. Like there's, there's way more to this than what you're giving it, you know? So I think that was it is just, I went back and reread some of the stuff I read as a kid, but that was mostly stuff about like, um, like black liberation and the black Panthers and things like that. And then I started to read more in depth stuff about the SLA and, you know, from that, I started to learn about all these other groups like like George Jackson Brigade. You, I know you uh, did an episode on that a while back. And, you know, the Vince Ramos thing, everything I read kind of drew them back to what they, you know, that they were the, sort of the, the catalyst for the SLA. So I was always like, well, why doesn't anybody talk about these this group? It's And, and just as you read the stories, it just got way more interesting. And also, um, since they were based in Stanford – you can go on the Stanford website, and they have a digital archive of um, – Vince Ramos had, like, a weekly newspaper called Pameo – Pamea, uh, P-A-M-O-J-A, I believe is the spelling. And you can go through all that, and it's it's fascinating just because it's – you know, it, 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 I don't know. I think the main thing I always found fascinating about the, the radical – like, the white radical groups of the 60s and 70s is it was just uh, – I don't know – there's elements of it that were so cartoonish, and also um, they're obviously using, you know, the Black Panthers as a vanguard to this movement. And in that, they're kind of adapting their own um, rhetoric and, uh, you know, slang and things like that. And it's, I don't know, it, it's it's kind of crazy. It's also, it's like always, uh, I guess that's always the way, like, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Beatles, <laughs> the Beatles played, uh, you know. R&B music because they wanted to be because they wanted to be uh, African American. <laughs> so maybe that was why these these kids adapted all the the, the lingo and the rhetoric to because they thought that would make them closer to the Black Panthers. I don't know. But um, let, let me ask you this: when you were looking into Patty Hearst's story, did you uh, read Brad Schreiber? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually I, I, I contacted him um, when I started the Vince Ramos article to get some information, and I also I used his. Uh, book as as reference uh in the article um so yeah i read that book it's it's incredibly fascinating um yeah but, we had we had brad schreiber on the on the show a few times and his book is called revolution's end uh, mm -hmm. about the, the sla and uh, there's very very credible evidence that uh, patty hearst was part of a a, a reading program at the uh, yeah. vacaville prison yep and that yeah. she met uh, Nasinke. What, what was his other name? Uh, 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 Donald DeFries. Donald DeFries, yeah, who had all kinds of uh, bizarre things in his background. And, and he, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying, yeah. And there was also uh, Mary Alice Stein, I believe he mentions her in his, in his book as well, who was a Vince Ramos member and was a friend of Patty Hearst. And I believe it was, you know, she used her student ID or something because they looked so much alike. To get into Vacaville and to, to, you know, be part of these reading groups and or um, be apparently, you know, intimate with uh, Donald DeFries. The yeah. fascinating. And then we, here we have people like Tubin, you know, who's a very uh, trustworthy character, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And their official version of events. But why do you think it is that Patty Hearst goes along with the, these alternative realities? Uh, uh, well, I mean, f from what I understand, she was not – If, uh, from what I understand, uh, Tubin reached out to her many times oh, yeah. to be a part of his book, and she refused. And so he I, – I mean, in my I – I can only you know be a armchair psychologist uh, slash journalist here. It seemed like since he couldn't get her on board, he cooked up this cockamamie um, narrative that she was – you know. Uh, but she wanted to be a revolutionary, and then she didn't want to be, and you know, whatever else. I mean, which could be true. I, you know, I don't know. I'm not in her head, but it also seemed like it was a very easy way to wrap up what I mean, uh, what I will call a very half-assed book. You know, I mean, any interviews you, you've you've uh, I've seen or heard with him about that book, he he really seems like excited or you know to tell that like, oh, I didn't even have to leave my house to. To write this everything's on the internet it's like <laughs> wow cool like so this is just wikipedia 
entries <laughs> that, you, that you just slapped into a book, buddy? Like, yeah. all right. Or, or whatever memo he was sent to, to, to put in the book, the narrative. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing is, it, you know, those are the people, you know, that in the whatever you want to call it, the mainstream media are given the carte blanche to take these these moments in history and just run wild with them to create a narrative that everyone can kind of like shake their heads at like, yep, yep. That's what we're going to go with. All right. Like, you know, next, you know, and they just move along to the next thing. Like, you know, the, the, as far as the Vance Ramos thing goes, you know, you, you can go into uh, the, that book days of rage, the Brian Burrow book. Like there's a sentence about that, about mm. them. Like, I don't even know if there's a mention in Jeffrey Tubin's book about them, you know, but Seeing again, like since I'm kind of like a, a punk rock guy, and I've always been more interested in the more arcane information than the stuff that's on the surface. It, that goes to you know me just liking more obscure music and and books and stuff like that. I rather than use that stuff as a reference, I was going and finding old like you know use use books like um, like Paul Avery, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, The Voice of Guns, which was a, the book he wrote about the SLA that has a lot of information about Vince Ramos in it. Um, and there's also Heavy Radicals, which is a book that came out a few years ago about the the, um, the, the Revolutionary Union that turned into the Revolutionary Communist Party because that was a break-off. Revo- uh, Vince Ramos was a break-off from the original Revolutionary Union that Baba, Baba Bakian was a part of. So... You know, there's all this information out there. It's just, you know, it gets shoved down um, rather than, you know, it gets shoved down in the, in the whatever, in the, in the, in the uh, road to trying to tell the most easy, you know, cut and dry story of these, these groups. Uh, you know, coincidentally, I just did an interview with a couple about Afghanistan and uh, the, the CIA initiation of the, uh, the counter uh, a Russian attack there back in the 70s uh, under mm-hmm. Brzezinski. And, uh, and she says, but all people know is that movie, Charlie Wilson's War. <laughs> right. yeah, they, yeah, they, exactly. they, they come out with an official movie, they come out with a book, and then that's what people remember, you know? But exactly. and uh, another thing, too, you were talking about the comic book quality of some of these actions and groups. Uh, and did you know that uh, the seven heads of the serpent of the SLA yeah. are the seven feasts of Kwanzaa? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was all. Uh, it was all. Uh, what's that guy's name? Ron, the guy who headed United Slaves. Ron, I'm going to say his name wrong. Um, but I'm sure you know about that. They were kind of like the rival. Yeah, right. K- K- Karami or Kwame, something like that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I mean, that was the catalyst. Yeah, that was the catalyst for Kwanzaa, and I just find that. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll admit it. I didn't know that till. Three or four years ago. Oh yeah! No, oh yeah! No, nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's amazing because you do see those old SLA like fly, whatever you want to call it, flyers or um, literature or whatever, and they have those the seven headed snake on it. And um, yeah, it's it, yeah. There's so much. That's the thing is like with this stuff, it's so much. Yeah. It'll make your head spin, you know. To just it's it's you know if, for anyone to ever have a complete. Um, you know, a complete story on it would is would be um, really difficult. <laughs> it's you know, it's a little bits and parts of it that you, if you just keep pulling the threads, it just will drive you batty. Yeah, like in your article, you describe about the defense Ramos that the the Cointel Pro infiltration, you know, FBI local police infiltrated the groups, and that's what caused uh, the destruction. Yeah, and it, the other thing is if you go on the Stanford. A website, like I said, where they have this complete archive of their their uh, like weekly or biweekly newspaper. You know, I'm I'm not uh, I don't I don't claim to be the smartest smartest guy in the world, but you know you can read these papers and be like, well, of course they found out what you were doing. <laughs> like they're just putting it out there in the open and kind of boasting, like, yeah, like look what we did. Like for instance, when uh, they break this guy Ron Beatty at a at a out of prison um the next week the the copy of their newspaper says like you know political prisoner freed fence ramos member we don't know anything about it (laughs) but but we're really happy that he's out and then they have like a page-long article about you know this hard luck story of about this guy that they that they didn't break out of prison and yeah again you're just looking at you're like are you looking to to get caught or are you this 
you know, you guys are college kids. I, I figure you're smarter than this. <laughs> but it's it's you know, it's just amazing to me, you know, that they just every week would put out this, you know, their own stories about how they, you know, oh, we uh, smashed windows on on the main on the main street in Palo Alto, or we, you know, we uh, the cop came to our door and we threatened him with a shotgun, and you know, they're bragging about it, and you're like. Okay, well, this is – I mean, I'm, I'm hardly like a, a reactionary guy, but on the other hand, this is America. So, like, when you do stuff like that, like, you get – I don't want to say you get what you deserve, but you get something. <laughs> you, you get a reaction. Well, yeah. Are you familiar with the whole Dave McGowan theory of, of weird scenes inside the canyon? Uh, I know the book. I've, I've, I've never read it, but I am aware of the book. Well, and you're, yeah. you're aware of the theory behind it, right, that the whole counterculture, the hippie movement was pretty much yeah. A, yeah, a government uh, – I don't, I, don't, I don't know why we always say government. I think it's more capitalist interests um, who manipulate these things and create these things. Um, well, yeah, I, I think – I mean, and that is – that's the thing. It's like you, you – it's so obvious what some of these people did, and it's so out in the open that, yeah, it, it's easy to just be like, I, I think this was all a, you know, yeah. it was all a, a front or, you know, conspiracy or, you know, I know that's – not the coolest word sometimes for people to use, but it, it is very weird in the way that these people could just uh, walk around and do this stuff and not really suffer horrible. You know, it, they, they certainly didn't suffer um, the consequences that people that were involved in, uh, you know, the Black Panthers or the Black Liberation Army did. Mm. You know, they they get to uh, be college professors and et cetera, et cetera. So and that's not it. Whatever. I'm not. Um, that's not a diss on anybody. It's right, right. We can't. Yeah, we can't. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are they called? That white paper people. The white. Uh, um, white collar. No, no. <laughs> no I, I forget what the word is called. Uh, when yeah. you, you start pointing oh, people oh, out, you know. whitewash or no, no, I, I forget what it is. Um, uh, anyway, anyways, yeah, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well. Did they accomplish anything? Uh, Vince Ramos. Well, apparently in the beginning they did. Um, the, the whole thing is the, the group originally was founded by a guy named Aaron Mangiano. Uh, let, me, let me try that again. Uh, Aaron Mangiamalo, I believe is the way it's said. And he was um, like he was um, like a brown beret and was yeah. involved in like Chicano um, – Whatever uh, liberation things in uh, in Palo Alto, and in the beginning, uh, Vince Ramos seemed to be a community based group. They they started, pardon me, they started a um, like a free college, and they had like um, like free health care. They're basically mirroring what the Panthers were doing, I guess. In um, you know, in in Berkeley, I mean, in uh, like Oakland, and okay. in, in that area, and. And it seemed like that was what their focus was initially. And then, again, it, it, it's, there's different different um, paths that the story can take. The one is that apparently um, Manginello, who did a lot of uh, like uh, agitprop or, or um, protests, uh, there was a, a, a Dow factory in the area that was making napalm. There was a lot of protests. He did a silent protest where he – just you know, sat in front of the the, the uh, factory for a few months. Or, excuse me, a few weeks, and they would you know hose him down every day with a you know with a fire hose or whatever. Like, eventually he got pneumonia and had to be hospitalized. And people say that's where he made the turn of like wanting to do more direct action things um, to get to get results. Um, but you know, the other thing is, it seemed like they were primarily a um, Chicano based group and then once they started to accept the the white radicals into their group is when it got more uh, whatever edgy or and or like did more direct action so probably prior to um, getting involved with Stanford students or other um, other radicals that were in the area they probably did you know they look like they got a lot you know accomplished things for for the um people in their community but it seemed like once the uh like uh the, the the people from the revolutionary union who broke off from that and joined the group it seemed like that's when it really went full bore into this you know off the pigs uh you know very 
you know, hard rhetoric of, of armed struggle, um, et cetera. Um, you know, the one thing, uh, somebody that I interviewed for the Vance Ramos article told me they were a part of the Revolutionary Union and then they left. And uh, one of the, the, the people that became uh, one of the leaders who was part of Revolutionary Union, uh, Bruce Franklin, tried to uh, get him to join Vance Ramos. And just he, he basically was like, I don't I don't even want to repeat what he told me to try to get me to join. But it was ridiculous. And, you know. Everybody kind of skipped the they skipped the step where where you know you have to have organizing prior to trying to start an armed revolution. Like they just wanted to skip that step and just go go crazy. Well, I don't know, crazy, just crazy. Um, but just go right into it. I think it was something where they didn't want any kind of five year plan or anything. Like they wanted the revolution to start then and there, and they weren't going to. You know, they weren't going to have any plan in place, really. They were just going to go wild. So they had no successes from their, their attempts at the more aggressive uh, paramilitary activity. No, other than, like I said, other than breaking windows. Breaking, yeah, breaking windows, but also breaking um, this guy, Ron Beatty, out of prison. Okay, right. Uh, right. Okay. In, in, uh, in Chino, they, they planned a prison break for this guy who, uh, I guess, Vince Ramos had a prison outreach program. And um, they started to recruit people out of prison to be Vance Ramos members. And, you know, I, I'm sure some of them really did believe in it. And others were just going along because they saw a bunch of overzealous kids who really wanted to prove themselves. So uh, this plan was put in place to, to uh, break this guy, Ron Beatty, out. And um, like I said, it, it was a, a situation where he was being taken to court for or taken – to, for a hearing or court somewhere, so he was being um, transported from the Chino uh, male correction facility and taken to a, a courthouse nearby. They knew that. They performed an ambush, a two-car ambush. They drove the, the car, the, the police the police van off the road. They broke him out. They threw the two police officers in the back of the van and it just shot at them point blank. And uh, one of them uh, was murdered the other one was just wounded and um that just you know it just started this escapade of them um you know carting him from place to place to keep him out of trouble and them out of trouble and then eventually when he was caught along with um dean dobson who was another vince ramos uh member he just he sang like a bird and basically said you know i i, I was just looking to get out of prison like i didn't believe in any of this crap they were saying <laughs> or sorry like you know they they uh you know he just he was just going along because he thought he you know he could get out of prison and you know that was it so uh, you know they're there did they did they accomplish anything no i mean they they thought they were but they got bamboozled by um the convict <laughs> so you know i don't think they really accomplished anything other than like i like i've been saying they they are they are you know, they're the, the people say that they are the uh, starting point for where uh, the Symphony's Liberation Army, <clears throat> which was probably an operation. No, I'm sorry. Uh, well, which was probably an operation. SLA was probably uh, you know a total. Uh, well, I think I mean my my little. Yeah. I mean I, I think SYNQ was definitely. I mean you know you look at that guy's. Uh, past he was definitely uh, an informant and, and was being used. Uh, I mean, I, I think he he probably was. You know, he was allowed to escape. And again, I don't. You know, I'm, we don't I'm, know. Yeah. Just, yeah. But I think he was he was allowed to escape. And I think what whoever allowed him to escape wanted him to infiltrate. You know, more black like a you know black liberation uh, groups. And it, from what you know, from what you read, uh, maybe maybe it's in Brad Brad's book that. You know, he would he was you know coming up to these people like, hey, you want anybody killed? And they're like, no. <laughs> you know, they could tell. You know, people can tell when a provocateur. Uh, yeah. Well, you'd hope up in their midst. You you'd hope you'd hope at least. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I asked Mark Wright. He got what I'm, I asked Mark Wright. What I'm saying is yeah. that I think those guys knew that this guy wasn't on the level. Yeah. But he, you know, he he kind of worked his way in with like these white radicals who might have been a little like late for the you know late for the party in a way um you know by that point i i don't know if there was a lot of uh 
I mean, I, you know, I guess the Weather Underground were still doing bombings, but uh, I think like that whole maybe concept of a revolution was probably fading by the time, uh, you know, he he got to to Berkeley and you know got to know all these, uh, you know, whatever uh, Nancy Wing Perry and all those other people that um, that he, he that he kind of used used them as sort of his group um, to kind of you know do what the, what he did. You know, at one point. You know, people think he kind of went rogue at one point, which could be true. And then there's the whole, like, Col- Colson-Westbrook connection. You know, again, a lot a lot of stuff. A lot yeah. of moving parts to this story. Well, I'm going to take a break, okay? Um, you know, I'll, I'll ask you this question when we get back. Let's take this commercial break right now. Uh, we're talking okay. to Tony Retton. Uh, you can find him at uh, uh, substack.retz. Retman, R-E-T-T-M-A-N.com. Yeah, ret- Retman.substack.com. Oh, really? Retman.substack.com. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm really, uh, That's right. I'm really kind of tired. Right. I'm kind of tired today. I mean, the other website is no idols, HC, big cartel. Dot, dot, yeah. Uh, no idols, HC dot big cartel dot com. Okay. I got them yep. both wrong. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll be right back with Tony Retman. I got the name right at least. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And now a word from our sponsors. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, 7 days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents, they handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. Thank you so much for listening to the Opperman Report. I want to welcome all our new listeners at WWPR 1490 AM in the Tampa Bay area. We're brand new down here. We're getting a nice warm welcome. We have great advertising opportunities for local sponsors, local businesses, but also international websites and international companies too. We're on our other stations in California, Nevada, Utah, and on the internet worldwide. But down here in Tampa Bay, Florida, we have some great opportunities for you to come in and get very, very affordable advertising rates. Get a hold of me at Opperman Report at G email.com and we'll cut you a good deal a flooded home or business is never easy to deal with you're left with a mess to clean up having to deal with the insurance company to pay for the damages not to mention the memories that are lost that you cannot replace an aquadam can be another tool in your arsenal to protect your home or business from the floodwaters a hurricane storm surge or the king tides give aquadam a call at 707 704-2119 764-2119 or look us up online at aquadam.net. We can help. We're also offering 10% off the price to anyone who mentions they heard this ad on the Opperman Report. EmailRevealer.com People ask me all the time, Hey Ed, are you still a private investigator? I sure am. Go to EmailRevealer.com We handle adoption investigations, infidelity investigations where you give us your spouse's email address. We trace it back to online dating websites, catch them cheating online. Email tracing, locate or identify somebody from as little as an anonymous email address. Someone owe your money? Back child support? We can find that deadbeat. Locate his hidden assets. Locate his hidden bank accounts. Find his current place of employment and even assist you in obtaining a judgment and recover that judgment for you. EmailRevealer.com, digital forensics, computer forensics, cell phone forensics, recover deleted text messages, create a report that you can use in court. EmailRevealer.com, 800-572-9762. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Opperman Report. Talking to Tony Retman. You can find him at uh, retman.substack.com and also at noidolshc.bigcartel.com uh, to read all his articles and his books and his material. Uh, we've been talking about the Vince Ramos uh, 
in Stanford up there in California, radical organization, uh, leftists uh, from the 60s and 70s. And also, too, uh, we're talking about um, SLA and uh, the mad bomber, Sam Melville, uh, from mm-hmm. the New York area. Uh, so let me yeah. ask you about Sam Melville. Did, 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 tell us about Sam Melville. Who, who was he? Oh, uh, well, uh, Sam Melville was um, a guy who originally uh, was a – went to school and became, uh, became an architect. Um, you know, apparently he – had a hand in uh, building like a like the fountains in front of Lincoln Center, and, hmm. and you know um, he uh, you know he he was a, a a kind of a mover, you know mover shaker, very uh, you know, very involved in um, a, a pretty big uh, architecture firm in in New York, and uh, his his father was um, I believe he was a part of uh, the Communist Labor Party. And uh, all of a sudden, again, these are all narratives that you know people people have uh, put on the, the story. Some people say uh, you know his father basically you know sold out. I guess he you know quit the Communist Labor Party and uh, moved to moved to Long Island and opened a hamburger stand and uh, all this kind of you know all the, the, the total American uh, dream, I guess. And uh, Sam was a little uh, put off by that. And uh, then as well, I guess he felt, you know, he was a, a guy with a, you know, a wife and a kid and had a nice apartment on the, you know, upper, you know, upper west side of New York and, uh, you know, had a good job and f- maybe felt that he wasn't, there was uh, a void in his life or he was just going, al- he was, he wasn't as, he wasn't any better than, you know, his father that he was. Uh, not happy with so he you know there, there was the uh, uh, the, the Columbia uprising that you know Mark Rudd, Mark Rudd was a part of uh, apparently you know he, he joined in on that and that kind of got him started and he just let you know he left his wife he left his kid and uh, moved down to the Lower East Side and started hanging out with uh, you know the, the people the, the radical People that were down there at the time, uh, you know, like the, the the yippies and the the uh, the, the mother mother uh, mother effers, yeah, yeah, right, yeah up against and, the wall, uh, yeah, yeah, like you know, all the the, the radical groups are you know yeah. probably hanging out at like Peaceside Bookstore or with the guys from the Fugs or you know it just there was a lot you know obviously from what we're from what we're told there was a lot going on down there and a lot of uh, you know the, again. Uh, Starts of kind of radical, um, uh, you know, armed resistance or armed struggle, and uh, he he moved down there. He met a uh, what's her name, uh, Albert, uh, Janet, right? Janet Albert? No, Jane, uh, Jane or Jean? Jane Albert, yeah, Jean Albert. Yeah. yeah. She wrote that book, going um, growing up underground. Yeah, yeah we're getting and, old, uh, huh? We got you and me. We're getting old. <laughs> Get no, our memories. I, I mean, you know what? It's <laughs> it's like I said I, uh, before we started. Yeah started recording I, I i brought all these books out to the out to my office to be like oh yeah like you got to remember this and i that's the one book <laughs> i forgot to bring out but anyway um yeah so he he um started you know moved in with her and started becoming a you know part of more um you know radical thing uh, you know radical happenings uh apparently the, also it's um the uh what are they the the Quebec QLF is that their name? I forget the, the Quebec Liberation Front or yeah, yeah. The, they I guess he was hiding them. He 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 through some um, through some you know underground thing. He was uh, letting them stay at his apartment. That was after they uh, bombed the Canadian uh, Stock Exchange. I believe that was in like sixty nine, and they taught. Apparently, they're the ones who taught him how to build um, bombs. And uh, then it was also a matter of, you know, back then I guess you could, you know, you could, you could just buy dynamite anywhere. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but it, that wasn't good enough for him because uh, apparently he, uh, they did like a uh, whatever they robbed like a some place in the Bronx I want to say that uh, of all the, um, of the of dynamite. So that's what they built the dynamite with was from this stolen di- dynamite, and. Um, you know, I think the, the first couple, first couple attempts at, at bombing things didn't go well. I think it was something where he he bombed the, um, geez, what is it? The like uh, the United Fruit, like uh, yeah, United Fruit, 
because he thought that they were like exploiting Cuban workers. But then it, it turned out that that wasn't even the whatever had a sign there on the dock, but it wasn't even it was abandoned. Like it wasn't even, uh, uh, you know, operational. But then uh, then it went into bombing. Uh, what are like uh, uh, Mar- uh, Marine Midland? Uh, Federal Office Building in Foley Square, uh, Army Induction Center in Whitehall Street, uh, Manhattan Criminal Court Building, um, and they were all built by him. Uh, and they were then he had a little cadre of people that were delivering the bombs, like Gene Alpert, and uh, another guy who was was you know he was he was much older than everybody else that was down there. And uh, there was another guy that he met down there that was more more his age. Um, that was one. He was a part of the crazies, and uh, that guy who ended up, you know, he he was, you know, Rob. Um, he was George Demerol was his name. He uh, ended up being a uh, informant. He he was an older guy, and he was one of these guys who just kind of volunteered to be an informant. Mm-hmm. And he, he apparently he would go around and like suggest like, hey, you know, be really, uh, you no. Know, you know, be really cool or, you know, be really radical or we blew up the Brooklyn Bridge or, you know, things like that. And again, uh, you know, people would just be like, eh, I don't know about that. That's that's a little too much. But uh, he was one of the guys that was helping um, Sam, you know, plant these bombs around. And that was eventually the guy that, uh, you know, they were going to plant a bomb, I think, uh, in the armory building. And something happened where it didn't have they didn't want to do it because of something where they, if they they were going to put it in a truck because the trucks would get brought into the armory building at night but the trucks were on like a residential side of the street and he didn't want to like the bomb to maybe blow up in front of like a you know somebody's house so they called off the the action and that's when apparently you know they were busted um so he uh he was arrested apparently he also um tried to escape he uh held a held a, a guard he, he took off his belt and, and you know whatever like handcuffed the guard with his belt and he got maybe two stories away before he was caught again and uh he eventually was yeah he was he was switched all around and then he was put in attica uh where he did a uh, apparently he wrote a, a, a an underground newspaper there called the iced pig which are that's a great name. Um, and uh, I think coinciding with um, the murder of George Jackson in California, um, that was when, what was the, the start of this uprising in Attica that he was a part of. And, uh, you know, they apparently he was digging, you know, he dig, dig, he digged like, uh, like uh, ditches and foxholes to throw bombs from and, uh, I guess when uh, uh, what was it? Was it Rockefeller? Was that I forget who the the governor was at that time? Who who just basically you know brought brought uh, the state police in there and you know just let them fire away at anybody. Uh, right. He was one of the first people picked off and uh, passed away. Uh, and my knowledge of him, uh, how I first found out about him, there's a. Uh, kind of an avant-garde modern composer named Frederick Wazinski, who did a, two pieces that he based on um, text by Sam Melville, because it, when after he after he died, they put out uh, this book, Letters from Attica, that were you know, uh, you know as the title suggests, uh, letters that he sent to Gene Alpert and other people um, about how you know this revolutionary spirit is not dying in prison. He's anything he's stronger and he knows you know knows why he's there etc etc so this um yeah this modern composer uh Rizinski put all the text to kind of these um just kind of like i think it might be like xylophone it's just very like simple tones and, and him reading these texts over and over again that was how i found out who he was initially and so I had a working knowledge of him, and again, it, it's it's one of these things where I read the uh, Brian Burrow book, Days of Rage, and he's he's mentioned, you know, it, it's kind of like the intro, but it, it, it doesn't go into much depth of, of, about him. 
So, uh, did, did you get a chance to read the, the Leslie uh, Pickering book? I do. I, I have that. Yeah. Uh, it's good. It, I think it's a. It is good. It's. I think it's a lot. You know, a lot of the source materials from other, a lot of you know from from a lot of other stuff. Well, you know uh, his story, right, Pickering? Oh, he's a ELF, he's a, yeah, eco terrorist. Yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> well, I don't know about terrorist, but he was accused of. Uh... Well, apparently, <laughs> that's like what he calls himself. <laughs> <laughs> Does he? <laughs> I had him on the show. Okay, and by the way, too, you mentioned Mark Rudd. Too, I had Mark Rudd on the show too. Yeah, yeah. I meant uh, that, right. Yeah. Uh, but but let me ask you a question because we're getting toward the end. Let me see how much time we have left because uh, I, I got a, like a big question for you. That's forty-seven minutes fifty-four. Uh, let me ask you B- before I do. Is there anything else you want to tell us about the uh, Sam Melville? No. no okay. No. Okay. You mentioned uh, like the, the murder of George Jackson, and mm-hmm. this inspired the George Jackson Brigade. Yeah, uh, a, a, a retaliatory uh, uh, armed reaction to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we have uh, back at this time all these different groups popping up, like you were saying, these armed groups, uh, some suspicious, some maybe generic and, and genuine. Um, mm-hmm. and, and here we have today where you have a situation like George Floyd where even mm-hmm. middle-class soccer moms are taking to the street and getting serious. And we had autonomous zones. We took over entire... Uh, areas, streets, blocks, uh, and sustained uh, control of these areas. Uh, but still, not that, uh, again, that same tactic of resorting to these bombings and, sh- and shootings and snipers and kidnappings. Uh, whereas on the other side, this question's going to go on forever. It's like, sit down, <laughs> just take a seat. <laughs> on the other end, the right wing have organized in armed militias, open carrying, showing up, shooting, written hour with this kid, written house, yep. mm-hmm. right? Uh, openly shooting with the support and cooperation of the police. Uh, so it, what do you make of all that? What do you make of all that, man? What's going on? I think it's, you know, uh, oh, man, there's a lot there's a lot I, there. I, but I, I, I think in one aspect, it's, it is some weird cyclical thing. You know, sometimes, you know, I'm, uh, I do sit and think about it in the way of, you know, you, you talk to people, older people who are just regular working, working Joes or, working Joes and Josephines <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. And when you ask them about Black Panther, like any of this stuff, they're just like, those people were nuts. Like, yeah. like they, they just want nothing to do with it. They just think those people were were crazy and, you know, whatever. You know, it's just, they, they were out of their minds and it, what they were doing was not going to accomplish anything. So I, sometimes I do wonder, like, in 30 years from now, it, it, is 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 history going to somehow flip over in the way that these armed right-wing militia people are going to be the equivalent of what we're talking about right now? You know, like whether underground or SLA where people are just going to say like, people were nuts. Like, you know, they thought they were going to overthrow the government with well, how many people uh, were at that insurrection? A couple hundred, maybe. Well, yeah, like, but, but stop and think though. You had those organized proud boys, those guys, uh, you know, with their military gear, you know, Organized in formation. You know, the left never took over the capital. Uh, not even no, close. No. Yeah. No, I know. I know what you mean, but uh, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Is like, is is everything going to flip to the to the to to the right in that way? Of that, normal people are in the same way normal people weren't into armed struggle or any kind of crazy stuff in, the, in from the left in the 60s and 70s. Are people, you know? Years from now, going to say, "Oh, well, that was just a bunch of bunch of crazy people," and or are there going to be younger people mm. that are going to look to them as some kind of uh, the 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 start of of uh, some kind of weird right wing uh, overthrow? You know, right? Um, that's how, that's like what I think because you know you said Mark Rudd, and I thought he brought up a really interesting point when you interviewed him when he said something like. You know, when he talked about the insurrection, it was, you know, he's like, it's more or less, the, you know, kind of the, the same thing. Like these, these guys thought that they could overthrow the government, you know, you know, by charging the capital and they had no, you know, they had no organization, you know, not, no, not much organizational skills and thought that they could skip this step mm. um, by just doing that. And, you know, he, he kind of says like, maybe that's where we were at the same time. Like, Maybe we just weren't or, like we weren't organized enough. We just wanted we wanted what we wanted now. So we were, you know, we were planning to just do these 
provocative um, actions without really thinking about the consequences. And, and, but um, the thing is, too, is but the handbook of guerrilla warfare, the Che Guevara handbook of guerrilla warfare says that you can create the conditions of a, a revolution by uh, initiating um, oppressive police and, and military oppression against the, the, the indigenous people, and then they would rise up against it, was, was the theory, as, as far as I understand. Yeah. I mean, you... <laughs> so you, per, yeah. Per, perhaps, I mean, perhaps the theory was flawed. Perhaps the theory was flawed. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I do understand what you mean, and I think that's it, is that, you know, in the past few years, the, you could erase, you know, these things of guys planting bombs or Proud Boys or... You know, all these provocative kind of bombings or, um, you know, more or less, you know, huge street battles. You know, sometimes you read you read the reports of that. You could, you know, if you want, you could erase the names and, and the names of the groups and the names of the people. And, you know, sometimes you can just put in the names of <laughs> radicals from the 70s in a way. You, you know what I mean? Um, but again, I don't, I, you know, I think with a lot of stuff, I look at it less from, uh, I don't know if it's the right, like, I look at it from a less of a political viewpoint maybe and more like psychological in the way of like a lot of these you know I, I think a lot of these people um were you know they had a lot of guilt for the way they were brought up and and how you know how how well to do their parents were and things like that so they thought doing these provocative actions would you know um whatever save them or, or make them look better uh if they didn't go along with the with what their parents were doing you know um that's sometimes how I how I look at it, you know. You know, they, they, these are people who are from the first generation of America. Well, you know, probably first generation of America, like young people that could they had to get whatever they wanted, you know. So, and they probably were never told no as, as children. So this was the only way they they, they knew how to uh, get what they wanted is to just throw a tantrum <laughs> in some weird way. You uh, did, did you yeah, do any stu- that- did you do any study into to the Red Army faction in uh, Biter Meinhof? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've read. Uh, it's funny. I have that book right here because I I started rereading it, the Stefan Alps book about them, and uh, because I, the last week I I, I watched that um, Biter Meinhof complex. Oh yeah. Film. Oh, great film. Yeah, both of them are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah. good. Um, the book, yeah, and the book is based on the film, but uh, it, it, you know, yeah, it, it, kind of the same thing in, in, in a way. It's just that. You know, again, with Weather Underground and and Red Army Faction, it does seem like it's like people. And I, I'm sorry if I if I'm like making light of this stuff, but it's like hmm. almost like guys who people who who couldn't play an instrument but wanted to be cool. <laughs> like you know, like instead of playing an instrument, I'm going to play in a bomb because they, because they definitely dressed a certain way and tried to look a certain way to what they thought like a revolutionary should look like. And I don't know. It's it's to me that's that's uh that's another kind of thing that i pin onto it but uh the red army faction definitely uh oh, yeah it's, uh, another interesting story and a lot of people same thing like uh their parents were you know unapologetically uh fascists <laughs> so they mm. they had a reaction towards that you know yeah, at one point uh, uh by red army faction had the support of i think 13 percent of the entire, uh, country of germany uh, but, but I might be all, all of uh, Western Europe, but we are out of time. We're out of time. Okay. And, and by the way, that's how the whole thing started with the ID cards and state IDs and things to uh, crack it down the Red Army faction. We've been talking mm-hmm. to Tony Retman. You can find him at uh, RetmanSubstack.com or, or NoIdolsHC.BigCartel.com. Uh, Tony, thank you very much, man. A lot of a lot of good stuff here. I hope people uh, look up your your material and, and, and take it in. No, no, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And now a word from our sponsors. EmailRevealer.com. People ask me all the time, hey, Ed, are you still a private investigator? I sure am. Go to EmailRevealer.com. We handle adoption investigations, infidelity investigations, where you give us your spouse's email address. We trace it back to online dating websites, catch them cheating online, email tracing, locate or identify somebody from as little as an anonymous email address, someone owe you money, back child support. We can find that deadbeat, locate his hidden assets, locate his hidden bank accounts, find his current place of employment, and even assist you in obtaining a judgment and recover that judgment for you. EmailRevealer.com, digital forensics, computer forensics, cell phone forensics, recover deleted text messages, create a report that you can use in court. EmailRevealer.com, 800-572-9762.
Before Epstein was the Franklin cover-up, before that, the Finders, and long before that, the Cleveland Street Scandal. Pedogate Primer is a concise intro and overview of a growing child abuse epidemic worldwide. It features shocking instances of institutionalized and organizational pedophilia throughout history. Churches, cults, the world of arts and entertainment, the government, NGOs, charities, and major corporations are all complicit or culprits in many instances. Pedogate Primer delves into material that for many may seem like the stuff of conspiracy theories. For this reason, the book draws on academic resources, declassified documents, and other reliable sources, and steers clear of conjecture. Such shocking true stories need no embellishment. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, 7 days a week. Just log into kmdlaw.com. That's kmdlaw.com. Or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. That's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be. Because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. Thank you so much for listening to the Opperman Report. I want to welcome all our new listeners at WWPR at 1490 AM in the Tampa Bay area. We're brand new down here. We're getting a nice warm welcome. We have great advertising opportunities for local sponsors, local businesses, but also international websites and international companies too. We're on our other stations in California, Nevada, Utah, and on the internet worldwide. But down here in Tampa Bay, Florida, we have some great opportunities for you to come in and get very, very affordable advertising rates. Get a hold of me at Opperman Report at gmail.com and we'll cut you a good deal a flooded home or business is never easy to deal with you're left with a mess to clean up having to deal with the insurance company to pay for the damages not to mention the memories that are lost that you cannot replace an aquadam can be another tool in your arsenal to protect your home or business from the floodwaters a hurricane storm surge or the king tides Give Aquadam a call at 707-764-2119 or look us up online at aquadam.net. We can help. We're also offering 10% off the price to anyone who mentions they heard this ad on the Opperman Report. Hey guys, if you like the show and you want to show your support, uh, check out the Opperman Report Patreon. Uh, you can go there and become a member uh, for $3 a month. We have all the shows that you hear Monday through Friday on AM, FM radio. We have all those shows, but we cut out the ads. So you can hear that content ad-free. Uh, there's a $5 section where we put up all the old uh, member section shows and are going up over there. And then there's a $10 section where we have brand new content. Eight hours of exclusive content per month uh, goes up there in the $10 section. But listen, I put up a lot of free stuff, too. We put up documents, court documents, photographs, announcements. So you should make the Opperman Report Patreon a, a stop. You should stop there once a day and check out what's going on over there. Uh, that's Opperman Report Patreon.